She worked at Sprint Nextel as the head of Sprint CNS group, where she led the largest and broadest rollout of DAS systems throughout the U.S. Her focus on quality, performance, and speed to market resulted in hundreds of ses successful implementations. Please join me in welcoming Darlene. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. What I want to do is uh, I want to introduce our panel here, and then we can get started with some questions. First, let me introduce uh, Terrence Brooks. Terrence is uh, Sprint Director of Sales for the Custom Network Solutions. The Sprint CNS Group has over 10 years of experience of enabling wireless campuses by delivering coverage and capacity solutions. Uh, Terrence and his team uh, work to drive sort of that speed to scale and overall uh, in-building DAS solutions throughout the, their enterprise customer base. So welcome, Terrence. We've got next Doug, Doug Lauder. Doug Lauder is Vice President of Business Development for Boingo's Managed and Operated Network, oversees the strategy and development of Wi-Fi and DAS networks for Boingo's uh, new and existing partnerships in vertical markets where reliable mobile data connectivity is now a necessity. Welcome, Doug. Next, we have Ken. Ken Sandfeld as Vice President of Sales for Solid. Ken leads sales activities for the company's DAS and optical network solutions in North America. Ken possesses over 16 years of experience in the wireless infrastructure industry and is passionate about bringing cutting edge new technology to the wireless space. Prior to his current leadership role, Ken held management positions at Mobile Access. Remek Spec Spectrian? Okay, and Zypher, sorry. Welcome, Ken. And uh, Corey, Corey Wagner, Business Development Manager, AT&T's Antenna Solutions Group, a Business Development Manager within that group with over nine years of wireless industry experience. Eight of those nine years have been focused within the Wi-Fi vertical, and over two years have been specifically focused on high-density deployments of large venues. Welcome, Corey. You know, as, um, as Tracy said, the role of Wi-Fi in the greater wireless network has been continually change, uh, changing, and we've struggled whether it is from a carrier perspective, uh, an integrator perspective, or, um, or that of a, an OEM to, to try to understand how does it all fit, how do you make it all work, and specifically, it, it seems like when we try to, we think we've got it figured out, what does that mean as far as the evolution of technology and how do you upgrade those solutions and which carrier really wants what type of solution? So this panel here will help us answer some of those questions um, as we walk through um, today's, today's panel. So, Corey, I'm going to pose this first question to you, put you on the hot seat a little bit. We're going to start out that way. Thank you. So given the growth of data usage, how has Wi-Fi been a part of your toolkit for a network build-out specific to AT&T? Sure. Specific to AT&T, we, we've used it in a, a few different ways. Um, and it, that's, to us, been one of the benefits of Wi-Fi. So one, we've been able to augment capacity, sort of a belt and suspenders type of solution to a DAS or, or macro network um, in a facility or, or given um, space and, and really try to offload traffic um, from our either cellular macro network or, or DAS network. Uh, in addition to that, we've also been able to utilize it as a, um, an enterprise um, product or commercial sale to um, enhance services or um, the ability of a, of a venue or customer to deliver content that they want to their customer and make that specific to the, the venue that, that that person is in. So that helps drive traffic to their venues um, as well as, you know, allowing us to enable those users without adding um, continuous stress to the to the cellular data network. Okay, thank you. Terrence, let me ask you, um, regarding Sprint, you know, you guys are, are certainly going through a lot of, um, a lot of upgrades and changes right now and, and certainly doing a lot of public venue opportunities as well, building DAS. How are you utilizing Wi-Fi in order to, uh, 
in order to take advantage of sort of that technology along with DAS? Yeah, great question. Do I actually need to push this? Are we good? Can you guys hear me? Okay, got you. Yeah, with regard to uh, that question, you know, given that we've spent a lot of time around the DAS infrastructure, um, there's 10 to 12 years of experience like um, Darlene was mentioning that we have that we're trying to leverage. And keeping in mind that smartphone explosion, which really necessitated the need for us to look at alternative solutions to, uh, to cellular. So uh, primarily from a voice perspective, and then we started uh, at the mobile broadband piece of it, you know, putting air carts in the Wi-Fi routers and trying to accommodate, you know, data that way. And that still continued to draw down on the macro network. And then we looked at, you know, the next step is realizing that Wi-Fi doesn't really cannibalize what we do from a mobile broadband perspective. From a user perspective, it actually enhances some of the things that we've thought key to our strategy, which is offering an unlimited data plan. And we see customers really resonating to that. So when you start looking at the economies of scale from a cellular-based solution to a Wi-Fi-based solution, it just makes sense economically to look at that as a way to maintain that differentiation in a market with regard to unlimited data. So as we look at more in building solutions and as we look at trying to address the demand for data, Wi-Fi is increasingly becoming a part of our toolkit. Um, primarily we're looking at it now in the education, hospitality, and retail space. We see those as some of the hot markets to really, really focus on. And given that we have a lot of embedded base there, we're trying to leverage existing relationships and existing infrastructure and partners to be able to offload uh, a lot of that capacity. So that's how we see it. That's how we're trying to take advantage of, of Wi-Fi, trying to maintain, one, a differentiation with unlimited data, and then two, looking at the economies of scale to implement Wi-Fi as opposed to some of the uh, DAS solutions we've done historically. Very good, thank you. Ken, tell us from, from an OEM perspective, I mean, Solid obviously supports both the carrier and the enterprise, and sort of give us your perspective as it relates to OE, the OEM. Uh, from an OEM perspective, uh, as you know, we make DAS solutions, and uh, right now, the you know with DAS, we typically use the word neutral host a lot, or neutral equipment, neutral DAS. Um, on the Wi-Fi side, that's typically not the case. Um, at this point in time, most Wi-Fi systems are deployed by whoever lands first on the project. Um, as such, the technology typically is designed around uh, a key uh, marquee that enters that particular facility, um, and then with that, what usually sa is sacrificed at that point is it's usually not a neutral solution. Um, it's usually not s very scalable in terms of long term. It's usually designed for single purpose today, how many users today. Um, and they're typically also not carrier grade. Um, there's a lot of things that go along with that, with that term. But, but the, um, as an OEM, the goal is to uh, innovate on the solution side. You see a lot of innovations going on on the DAS side. There's a lot of migration uh, going on between combining DAS and the infrastructure related to the Wi-Fi architectures. But from a, a neutrality perspective, a scalability, which is essentially the growth in the pipe, and I don't mean the pipe serving the building, I mean the pipe inside the building. Um, and then also the site of carrier grade, because the reality is uh, these solutions augment the existing uh, license bands, right? They're not to replace it. I mean, even though that's kind of happened in a lot of places, um, which means the carrier has to provide service levels to their the end user. The end user wants um, uh, pretty much a, a transparent experience, right? They don't mm -hmm. want to have to load an app and do different things, which means that the carrier has a certain level of uh, needs in order to make that happen. And the building owner needs to recognize that as well because the building owner is the one that's going to be agreeing to put this system in their building. So, so really it's about innovating the, the technology forward uh, to support those standards. Yeah, no, very good point. And, and Doug, that sort of brings me to you. From a value proposition to the venue owner, what, aside from connectivity, what does Wi-Fi really provide the venue owner? Sure, and uh, I'll, I'll kind of finish up your comment just really quick. I, I completely agree with you on the, on the not being neutral or carrier grade. And oftentimes, we find when we get to the venue that we're really competing against the venue. The venue tried to do it themselves, or they tried mm -hmm. to put some Wi-Fi in, and they tried to cut costs or you know bend corners, and, and, and they just didn't really get it right the first time. So oftentimes, we're called in to kind of clean up the mess, if you will. 
And you know, as, as the shift has gone from paid Wi-Fi, I think we can all remember when Starbucks charged for Wi-Fi, most airports charged you for Wi-Fi at one point in time, some still do. Uh, but as the shift moves, even in the hotel space from uh, paid to free, uh, there really needs to be a different model for paying for Wi-Fi. And you know, how can you, how can the venue still provide an amenity for free? That's not this ongoing expense that continues to climb as data consumption also climbs. And the ways that you can add value, I think, are we think of them in terms of either either first party, meaning some sort of marketing promotional tool that the venue can use to communicate to its customers or third-party advertising, meaning third-party uh, companies that want access to the customers within that venue uh, can promote their brands. So partnerships, st strategic partnerships, like maybe Starbucks would partner with iTunes as they do today, or they would partner with movies that are gonna be released and make you watch a little trailer before, uh, before you get access to the network, and that can help subsidize the cost. Maybe not fully, but uh, it, 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 it certainly takes away a little bit of the pain. Uh, and then, of course, the final way is, you know, as, as more uh, technologies do emerge, I think we heard this morning about, you know, the, the, the roadmap of Wi-Fi 802.11ac <coughs> and you, uh, as next generation hotspot, hotspot 2.0 becomes a reality, I think you'll start to see new monetization models arrive where, where carrier customers will seamlessly jump back and forth between cellular and Wi-Fi. And, uh, you know, as, 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 as that becomes a reality, that is yet another opportunity for the venue to subsidize a portion of the cost. Mm -hmm. so. so it's it's really safe to say that we're sort of getting to the point with the technology where it's not necessarily Wi-Fi or DAS, right? It's Wi-Fi is another uh, tool in the toolkit, so to speak. And then that sort of opens up the whole issue around how do we really get to neutral host Wi-Fi cap capability, right? That and scalability. It's taken us how many years from a DAS perspective to get to true neutral host DAS, and then the scalability effort when you know things are changing regarding LTE and, and those requirements. How do we treat Wi-Fi, which is obviously unlicensed spectrum, and create a carrier grade solution um, that is that enables sort of that capability? And I guess Ken, back to you. I mean, from your perspective, I know Solid's working on this. Um, as future releases come out, and I think it's a it's a big area of importance, you know, it, within the market. So, sort of your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think the thing you need to look at is um, if you look at any Wi-Fi uh, network, you have essentially a couple main components. Uh, the one that we're most familiar with is the access point. You know, whether it's hidden above the ceiling, let's say in this place, or several of them maybe hidden in the ceiling or on the wall, someplace. Um, the access points are essentially what's providing you your RF and also your capacity, the radio. Um, that part is, you know, is physics and, uh, you know, it's subject to how, how much interference you can manage and how many users you're trying to cover. So in a room like this, clearly, if an access point has 32 users, you're going to put enough of them to be able to handle it. My guess is there's not enough in here to handle all of us. <laughs> um, we're, uh, so, so we're, you know, so there's also the pipes getting to those access points. Uh, typically, we would install Cat 5e, um, you know, for access points. Uh, that that trend is also migrating to the potential use of fiber to deliver more higher capacity. But the the, f the part that we're focused mostly on is that infrastructure is shared. The part that is. Um, uh, is also shared is the front end of the system and where the carrier what the carriers are looking for is to be able to uh, handle their SLA separately uh, put in their own pipes and handle their own analytics because they want to service their customers themselves they don't want one neutral party necessarily to govern how they service those customers what that means is that you need essentially a box we typically call it a, a gateway at solid and that gateway handles that high security throughput to be able to auto-authenticate those devices in a transparent fashion. It sounds very simple, right? Just auto-authenticate the device. But the reality is there's a lot involved with connecting to the carrier's CO um, and the ability to authenticate those devices and be able to handle that throughput at the same time. And what that's causing is a new generation of boxes that essentially allows a neutral Wi-Fi capability because like I said the actual access point network uh, is pretty much shared it's kind of like the antennas and the coax and some of the fiber in a DAS it's shared 
Uh, you're sharing capacity, you're sharing potential amplifiers, and there's nothing you can do about it unless you want to spend a lot more money for separate infrastructures. So uh, really focused on the front end of the system to provide that neutrality, fairness, uh, the carrier's ability to mon mon monitor their own paths, uh, provide their own pipes, and handle their own customer service uh, in a fair, fair manner, hence providing neutral Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. And that's really, that's what we've accomplished on DAS. We need to do the same thing on Wi-Fi. And a lot of that is technology. It's, mm -hmm. There's models behind it, obviously, there's money models, but it really is a technology shift and migration of the equipment. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's it's we're seeing certainly the the demand, the requirement that's coming, and so getting ahead of that curve, I think, is absolutely a necessity within this space. There's no question. Um, speaking of sort of ahead of the curve, Terence Sprint has been one of the early adopters of of small cells, right? Mm -hmm. You've been deploying small cells in the network for a while, um, and continue to do so very aggressively. So to give us your thoughts on how the uh, coexistence of small cell DAS and Wi-Fi, um, how do they all work together, or, or what, what do you think the future plan is of, of sort of that overall coexistence? Yeah, yeah, great question. So I, I think the uh, name change this morning was definitely appropriate mm -hmm. of heterogeneous uh, networks, and we've been a big proponent of that for at least the last 12 to 18 months. Uh, right now, I think back to Ken's point, it's a technology play. Um, you, we've implemented DAS, um, we implement PICOs, we've implemented F uh, FEMTOs, uh, we'll have microcells, things of that nature. So we'll have all of this additional capacity to be able to address the data piece in the network. But then the seamlessness needs to happen between the handoff from one to the other. So I, I think it's incumbent upon the gear manufacturers that we select, uh, people like Solid, people like others in the industry that are developing that software, that technology to allow for that seamless handoff. Uh, one of the things from a venue owner standpoint is since we're so aggressive on the uh, femto cell, pico cell technology, is that they don't want to implement multiple of those. And they're going to want, again, back to Ken's point, they're going to want a, uh, one infrastructure to be able to support multiple devices. So with our network vision strategy where we're going in and replacing our entire infrastructure, we have the capability and a framework by which we can implement that new technology, new software, as we get the network vision you know, 2.0, as we're calling it, um, internally to be able to accommodate that. It's not there today, but I think as the technology develops, that seamless handoff uh, will happen, uh, and, and we think we can take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, very good point. And I guess, um, Corey, to you, tell us, um, Tell us, obviously the seamless handoff is an absolute necessity and, and AT&T is obviously also deploying, deploying uh, small cells in the network. But from, from an AT&T perspective, give, um, give us an idea of some of the different applications for using Wi-Fi to augment cellular and sure. how you do that today. I mean, you guys have, have been, I think, um, again, you guys have been really early adopters of that. Yeah. And I to, to piggyback on something that I think everybody's brought up too that will sort of lead into it, um, when, when we do use Wi-Fi, we really have to look at the, um, the venue or the application that we're going to have for it um, in the specific scenario. So whether um, it's a office building or outdoor area or you know stadium arena, there's also, in addition to the public or, or carrier devices that we need to enable other users that we're going to see that there's also a, um, a a back office component that that we have to care for and, and ensure that it, it's converged onto the same network whether that be a, a secure um, SSID for staff use in, a, in an office building maybe point of sale in a um, stadium or arena or um, even you know a student SSID on a campus so that they have access to those those local um, services that they need all of that you know becomes application traffic that's carried on the network and you have to be certain that, that the network is scaled for it and, it and you know it really becomes at that point a true partnership with the the venue or the location that you're you're trying to cover because all of that traffic has to be accounted for and and candidly if it's not it'll cripple the network and, and you know at that point it's it's of no value to to anybody no very good thank you um so doug one of the things that um 
that you piqued my curiosity on was really monetizing the, um, the Wi-Fi capability. And it, it's obviously very important to be able to use the infrastructure of a venue owner and create a win-win, right, um, in order to support both the carrier needs as well as create a compelling value proposition for the venue owner. Explain to me um, a little bit about sort of what you meant from monetizing that Wi-Fi infrastructure and, and really monetizing the overall mobile experience. I think that's interesting. Sure. So, um, you know, Boingo tends to get to venues before there's, not all venues, but most venues, before there's a need for small cells or DAS. So really we're solving a problem for Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. It's usually a venue that wants to give the Wi-Fi away for free. Uh, so what we'll do in a Wi-Fi deployment is we'll typically deploy a pretty robust fiber backbone, uh, put a big fiber plan in, uh, run the Wi-Fi network off of it, and then be there uh, and be able to um, use that should DAS or small cells ever become a tool within that building that the carriers need. Uh, so that's really the first way that we would monetize it is if the carriers decided that they wanted to hook into our fiber plant for DAS or small cells, uh, that would be a way that we would do it. Um, separately, advertising is becoming a pretty big component as uh, you know, Wi-Fi advertising becomes a little bit more mainstream. Uh, perhaps some of you have flown through one of our airports where you connect to the SSID, um, we kind of capture you and hold you hostage at the walled garden uh, you have to watch an advertisement or have to fill out a form or a survey before we'll get you access onto the, onto the Wi-Fi network. And Wi-Fi advertisers will pay a lot of money for this. We're advertising with a lot of Fortune 500 companies. Uh, they'll pay you know, significant premiums over typical banner ad prices. And the reason is because they've got the full screen and they've got your attention for 15 to 30 seconds. And you cannot do anything until you've watched their advertisement and, and until you've engaged with them. And, and, and for an advertiser, that's incredibly valuable. So that's another way that we can help subsidize the cost of some of these networks. And then the, the third thing that I would say that's becoming kind of newer and more important to a lot of venues is, is taking the massive amounts of data that's available from the Wi-Fi networks uh, without breaking any privacy laws, of course, and you know, using that to, to, to give insight to the venue owners themselves. So in airports, we have queuing solutions where you know, TSA can have a screen up that says, you know, just based on the pings coming from the phones and users' pockets, we can tell how many people are in line and extrapolate how long it's taking them to get through that line and, and give approximate wait times at security lines. Uh, we can also monitor uh, traffic with inside of some of our retail partners to you know, get a better understanding if showrooming is actually taking place. Uh, all these cool things that you know that 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 a lot of our partners will pay a little extra for, mm -hmm. and kind of help use that for more than just you know giving access to the Wi-Fi network. So, okay. very good, very interesting. Ken, explain. Um, it, I'm a venue owner, and as a venue owner, what is the what is the ideal time to consider Wi-Fi if, if a DAS is also going in? So I come to you and I tell you I have a Wi-Fi issue, but I also want to deploy a DAS, and, and I'm going to fund that as an enterprise owner. I believe they have to be done. I think they should be done at the same time. Okay. Uh, you know, the, the days of, you know, like Doug was saying earlier, you know, the, the, the own, building owner is trying to do it themselves, you know, the... Uh, you know, the Best Buy approach, right? You know, <laughs> oh, let's just go buy some APs, we'll put them on the wall. You know, it's the same thing, right? <laughs> uh, the reality is it's not true. It is not, not only is it not carrier grade, it's not even, you know, commercial grade uh, uh, type uh, solution. Um, more and more, uh, what we're asking the building owners to do is, is consider that the cabling in the ceiling, that being DAS and Wi-Fi, essentially look at deploying that infrastructure all at once. And um, uh, uh, the gentleman from, from Camden, as he put it, look, I'm going to put a tube, I'm going to put a coax, I'm going to put a cat five, and I'm going to you know, slip some other pieces of copper in there. Uh, that is the smartest thing you could do nowadays because you don't really know how the technology is going to migrate. Mm -hmm. uh, at Solid, we believe it's going to migrate towards optics because nothing's faster than the speed of light. Um, but the, uh, the reality is you just don't know how fast it's going to migrate. You don't know how fast radio, radios in the ceiling are going to migrate. Um, you know, ideally, the ideal future would be something like, well, you know, cellular, 4G, 3G, whatever, 5G. It deploys much like Wi-Fi, where you put the radios in the capacity where you need them. In order to do that, you need pipes everywhere. <coughs> and so uh, considering your cabling infrastructure is probably the most important thing. Uh, but at the very least today, 
you're, you're pulling a piece of coax and a piece of cat5 in order to augment that. Right. And uh, uh, so uh, very, very, you know, a lot of concern on uh, pulling the cabling in early and doing them at the same time. Uh, typically someone who's going to deploy a uh, high capacity DAS is also has the ability to potentially scale up a Wi-Fi system um, and, uh, you know, it needs to look at that, that infrastructure. So prepping for the future to avoid sort of ripping and replacing is in the best interest of not only the venue owner but obviously the carrier as well exactly. because we're seeing the explosive data growth continue. Yeah. And, the, and, the, and if you look at the number one rip and replace issue going on with DAS over the last, let's say, five to seven years, and the number one rip and replace issue with Wi-Fi, they're very similar. So you have DAS, which has gone from a density of one antenna every, you know, 7,000 feet mm -hmm. to now 3,000 feet. <laughs> it depends on what you're, you know, the density you're looking for. And then you have Wi-Fi, where they normally put an access point in one, in a, one in a room like this to maybe like six. Um, it's really the density of the radios and the density of the users, right? And so that's really what it's all about. That's that planning process. So if you don't design the infrastructure to be able to scale from 1 to 6 to 8 to 10, um, you end up having to rip and replace. And that's what we're going through at, in DAS right now. Um, I would say that probably 60% of the DAS systems that have been installed in the last seven years have to be not just short of rip and replace because they can't handle all mm -hmm. the new service densities. Uh, Wi-Fi networks, I would say, you know, Doug, is probably a question for you, but Wi-Fi networks are probably in the same boat. They've got new access points with new technology protocols, and then there's density issues, there's higher frequency, all those things. So that all relates to the infrastructure. Uh, also, not just how many cables you have in, where they're located. Um, a lot of, for example, at stadiums, we find that the biggest issue is you might need to move an access point 20 feet the other direction. So if your infrastructure is very rigid and mm -hmm. can't scale or move around very easily, that becomes a very costly issue. Same thing with DAS antennas. Uh, you know, moving them 20 feet, you know, or adding another antenna. Oh, we need one more right there. Oh, no, that's, that's a whole other conduit, Ryan. I mean, th those kind of things are really uh, increasing the cost oh, yeah. of these systems. And time, right? Time to Absolutely. deploy. I mean, it's, it's not... Uh, it's not something that happens real, uh, in a very fast manner. Um, I'm going to pose this question to both Terrence and to, um, and to Corey. But you talked a little bit about the type of verticals, that, right, where you're really seeing um, Wi-Fi and DAS become more prevalent. Tell us some of the unique challenges that Wi-Fi has helped you, um, help you solve or, you know, talk about, you know, at a high level sort of a, a couple of examples where you've deployed both um, and it's been in the best interest of sort of the pub, the venue owner as well as as well as the carrier. Yeah, I'll just give the example of a school. Um, so um, a, a dense urban area, uh, schools are typically early 1900s construction uh, from a macro coverage perspective. We've designed as best we can to penetrate that from a voice and data perspective. Um, that school decides to do a um, e-learning type initiative and all 2,500 students are now carrying uh, iPads. Um, from a cellular standpoint, if they were 3G enabled, that's a lot that's taxing from a uh, one sector that may be feeding uh, that school. Uh, when you look at it from a Wi-Fi perspective, though, the economies of scale are uh, much more effective for us to implement a Wi-Fi solution to accommodate 2,500 iPad users versus trying to do it from a cellular perspective. You know, one, just looking at the backhaul associated with it, you know, an access point is anywhere from five to $800. A sector for a BTS is 60. Um, the install associated with it. So there's a lot that goes into where it is helping us from a, that one example of education to be able to accommodate those guys. And the um, attractiveness of the access points from a Wi-Fi perspective are a lot better than actually us having to put a BTS that's you know, probably the size of one of these tables um, into an area that they probably don't have in an um, older constructed uh, school. So that's just one example of how we've uh, been able to implement Wi-Fi and it's advantaged us from an economic perspective and it also advantaged the school to be able to mm -hmm. do what they needed to do from a, a mobile learning or e-learning perspective. Very interesting. Yeah, Corey, you. Totally agree with, with that example. That's what we've seen as well. I would, 
I, I would use a, a corporate office building um, or, or even, you know, retail space is sort of another example of, of something very similar where, um, y you know, you, you also have the, the demand of piggybacking on the panel earlier, the bring your own device of the employees. So Wi-Fi is a way that's enabling those users to bring their device in. The, the corporate IT or security folks can, can segregate that traffic from the from the corporate network and ensure that you know their their devices aren't um, potentially putting them at risk for any um, you know any any outside um, malicious activity, but at the same time you know allow their their employees to utilize um, the things that they need to and candidly do it quickly to get back to work. Does it change at all if the venue is a stadium where you have more people concentrated in a you know a shorter period of time so from your perspective i know obviously at&t has been deploying wi-fi with das in stadiums to try to address some of the macro and, and capacity constraints definitely and, and for, for us you know as, as a carrier i think you know certainly it's it's um all about capacity in that scenario and um you know from a you mentioned a win-win perspective. I think the the um, the challenges for the venue um, can be unique. It, it may be um, that you have a specific venue who who doesn't sell out all their games, or you know is trying to bring more fans, um, you, you know, to to the stadium. So, so their opportunity may be in unique content or or an application, you know, that they can offer. Whereas, um, you know, you, you may have another stadium that, that has a very engaged fan base. So, so they're selling out every event, but the opportunity for them then becomes, we need to increase the spend of the, the fan base while they're there. So maybe that's a, you know, an a, a application platform that will allow them to, you know, purchase merchandise or um, gain additional access to, you, you know, say, a uh, a coach's press conference or things like that. So it really becomes a, a unique business case um, and, and, you know, really is a, is a creative process in a sense for, you know, each of those individual stadiums. Yeah. And that, yeah, that's sort of a question for you, but sort of how do we, how do we transition that information to consumer analytics and create an actionable strategy? Yeah, so, so first what I would say, totally spot on on the, on the content side. I think what what Boingo has seen internationally uh, in, in Europe and in Asia is, you know, in most of those markets, unlimited data was never a reality for anyone. So consumers were always a lot smarter about when they were on Wi-Fi versus when they were on cellular. Uh, the consumer is getting there here, but they're not there yet. And, uh, and having something to, to drive them online and to force them onto the Wi-Fi network, some sort of carrot is, is, is really important. Um, and being a consumption-based business, you know, generating revenue on a per session basis through advertising or crunching you know, data on analytics, the more consumption you have, the more powerful the tool becomes. And so that's why it's kind of a, you know, a chicken and the egg, having the content, getting the users online, getting them online, seeing what they're doing once they're online, and really either communicating to them in, in the first party sense through that as a marketing channel or delivering content from third parties that are paying you for it. Uh, it's, it's, it's all consumption based and you know, having more consumers on the Wi-Fi network, uh, which I think would also benefit the macro network is, is kind of the holistic solution that I think everyone's trying to accomplish. Okay, excellent, excellent. Tell us, um, it, it, this question probably means something a, a little different to each one of the panel members, but from each of your perspective, what does the roadmap really look like, and what should we be um, what should we be looking for as we move forward in this uh, the sort of the true coexistence and we get to neutral host and, and carrier grade? Um, Terrence, from Sprint perspective. Yeah, I, I guess you're going to see more data consumption. That's going to be the biggest thing. I mean, we're we're talking about it now, but you know the latest Cisco report talks about you know, 13x increase in data consumption over the next four years. Um, of that, you know, 46%, I believe the number was, is gonna be offloaded in some way. 
does that offload happen from a Wi-Fi perspective? Does that offload happen from an increased number of carriers via an in-building solution? Does that increased capacity come from a, a PICO or micro deplo micro cell deployment uh, within a given facility? So the future is going to hold for the implementation of all those things. And uh, I think the seamlessness and the ability for one to talk to the other and for that user to have a consistent experience is going to be what you're going to see going forward. From a sprint perspective, we balance that with the need to maintain that differentiation of unlimited data. We feel like that's something for the customer. We feel like that's something that um, we want to maintain the integrity of and continue to offer. And balancing all those technologies to be able to accomplish that is going to be paramount for us. Doug, what about, what about from Boingo's perspective and sort of your um, discussions with your customer? What does the roadmap look like? So, you know, we have really two businesses. One's a consumer business. Consumers pay us to access our footprint. And for them, really, it's about delivering uh, valuable venues that they're willing to pay for. Um, with our venue partners, it's, it's almost all technology-based, uh, trying to get ahead of what's coming down the pipeline, making sure that everything you're building, I think Ken spoke about earlier, everything being built to, to scale and, and really plan for three to five years as best you can. Uh, to avoid the rip and replace scenarios that you know some, you know, we've had to do, and a lot of our partners have also had to do. So I, I, I think from our perspective, just ensuring that you have, you know, with our venue customers, ensuring that you have an adequate network with proper service levels, so that you're committed to it, they're committed to it, and you know, frankly, from our perspective, uh, with regard to the carriers, they're also our customers. You know, we mm -hmm. we have offloading agreements with AT&T and Verizon, and. Um, if we don't deliver a carrier great experience for them, uh, then they're not going to roam with us and, and, and they're going to shut us off. And so we really have to ensure that when an AT&T customer walks into one of our venues and AT&T has asked to offload within that venue, that, that, that they're getting a, a, a better than or just as good an experience as they would have had from the, L, from the LTE network that was outside. And so I think that's, that's for us is the most important, is staying, staying ahead of the curve ensuring that we're deploying the technologies that are going to scale for at least two to three years. Uh, that's usually the cycle with Wi-Fi. Uh, and, and just ensuring that you know, everything is as, as, as good as it can be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. Let's go to Corey, and then I, cause I have another question, I guess, in relation to that, Ken, for you. But, but what about in regards to AT&T? Sure. And I think you agree with Doug. And Terrence really hit on, too, that just the growth, um, I, I think, that that specifically is one thing very much um, the same as, as Daz is it's really forced us to take a step back and evaluate how we deploy in the business models uh, behind which we do so um, in the sense that you know deploying a Wi-Fi network today is you know as much as three or four X what it was um, two, two years ago three years ago so um, you know we, we've really had to look at um, how do we build sort of a, a cost causer pays model and really divide the pie up? And, and the, the way that we've sort of looked at it, um, you know, more recently is, you know, take each party that's, that's going to be um, sharing in the network and look at the, the services and even the enhanced services that they're road mapping, whether it be, you know, multicast video, you know, over Wi-Fi, which is a new technology, or, you know, other mission-critical, um, you know, applications that they're running, and, and really determine, you know, who, who needs to invest what in the system, because, you know, just, just the same as we approach a DAS, we just, we don't have the, the time or the money to, um, to feed the demand that's there just, just to build it all at the, the carrier's expense. So, so we've really had to you know, look for um, partners and you know, Doug mentioned the monetization, you know, unique ways to, to do that so it really does become a win-win for everybody. Right, so it's unrealistic to continue to think obviously from a venue owner that, that the carriers will continue to fund these massive builds and um, they'll do it uh, to, in the same manner as, as aggressively as they have. So I think uh, we can look forward to sort of new models and new sort of cost sharing models um, becoming available to the marketplace. Um, Ken, so uh, from a roadmap perspective, but I'm interested in sort of what so Solid's views, but, but also it's sort of fair to say 
I guess that Wi-Fi is behind where we've what we've been able to achieve for DAS because we're now using Wi-Fi in a new manner, right? A manner that we hadn't historically used before, and so um, so now we have the combination of of Wi-Fi, we have small cell, and you know we in a lot of cases have public safety in many of these and DAS. So they all have to live together and coexist within that same environment and creating something that is going to be um, beneficial to the venue owner, but also meet the carrier requirements, particularly as they're challenged with um, spectrum and offload and, and capacity constraints. So sort of if you can give us, uh, give us your view from, from an OEM perspective. So, you know, as an OEM, uh, we, we look at, uh, you know, it, it's easy to get caught up in the uber technical details of deploying infrastructure and everything. But really what we look at is from the carrier's, the carrier's perspective, they have needs in order to provide service to us, the end users. Um, when we walk into a venue and we stare at our device, and note I said stare at our device because we're no longer glancing at it, we're staring at it at, for long periods of time. We don't judge it anymore by how well we can listen, of course. We judge it by how well uh, things happen, how fast they happen. Uh, we don't even, you know, you used to be, you used to judge a, a network by when you walked through a building, if it dropped, you'd say, oh, or, or outside, let's say. Uh, if it dropped, you'd say, oh, there must be a dead spot here, right? Well, from a network perspective for data, uh, you don't even, you're not even looking for dead spots, you're just looking at throughput. You know, so it's how people judge those networks. So from a carrier perspective, we're looking at um, the needs that they have for, for measuring their level of service, their quality of service, uh, their security. Uh, security is a huge issue. Uh, as the networks become go from being more of a dumb pipe to an active infrastructure that passes data, uh, security is a huge issue. Uh, and architectures that allow for fair uh, cost distribution. Um, uh, more importantly, we actually think that the ideal models are one where the um, uh, it can be a variable cost model um, because uh, any model that has you know one person trying to bear 100% of the capital equipment uh, it's just uh, it's very unrealistic and not only that uh, what the capital that's spent today may have to be completely replaced in a year from now uh, like for example the Super Bowl stadiums that have been built over the last few years a lot of them will require major retrofits every year <laughs> So it's a huge investment, and um, so the models are going to shift a little bit more towards, you know, uh, uh, a variable model versus, you know, assigning resources. Um, uh, then we have to look at the building owner. The building owner has a whole different set of needs. Uh, you mentioned public safety. Public safety is going to become a, a bigger and bigger mm -hmm. uh, situation in that when, some, when an event happens, I don't mean a good event, um, how is the network going to, how are the responders, how are the people that are, are ensuring the safety of the people in that venue, how are they going to be able to communicate uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a bad event? Um, uh, so there's a shared burden. The, the building owners have to look at their infrastructure as something that they're investing in as well. And they can expect that the operator that is looking to service their customers is going to pay their fair share as well. Um, and uh, so the safety, the cost offset. So the technology has to kind of go along with that. And I would argue that it really, uh, it's really, the OEMs are catching up right now. The technology, both on Wi-Fi uh, and on the license spectrum side, is actually playing catch up right now. Um, in other parts of the world, they're actually deploying networks a little bit more advanced and faster than, than we are. Um, in terms of, you know, we talk about small cell or net net networks. And, and really, I think that part of the future is um, an architectures that allow that IP scaling, uh, kind of like Wi-Fi networks have scaled as IP. Um, that's kind of where we see the future going. And we think the building owners and the carriers are both going to adopt that because really it's, it's more cost effective for everyone. Well, and I think, um, you know, to your point, I think as we've seen these systems become much more of an integral part of whether it's either an enterprise or a carrier's network and just day-to-day -day dependency, the need for better 
capability, right? So not just capacity and coverage, but making sure that it is always on and you know always available is become even more important. So your overall, not only the design, the deployment, but the grade of the actual equipment becomes just so much more important. But also ongoing monitoring, maintenance, and you know, sort of SLAs that um, support those capabilities um, we're seeing are becoming more and more important in some of those very critical verticals like healthcare and and um, even some of your multi-tenant enterprise facilities. Yeah, I'll give you I'll give you an example. Uh, if a if there was a fire here and the sprinklers came on. Uh, you wouldn't really expect that the Wi-Fi network would keep running, right? Oh, they're going to short out. They're going to get wet. Who cares, right? We're running out of the building. But if there was a bad, you know, uh, emergency situation here, uh, the things that you would have to have working, of course, you'd, or you'd want to have working, <laughs> are your fire department radios. When the fire department runs in here, the last thing you want is not them not to be able to communicate with someone outside that's manning the, wa the, the water hose. But I would also kind of extend that to the cell phone. If you're in here, there's smoke coming out there. You don't have a radio in your hand from right. the fire department. The fire department may not even be in here, but you want to be able to dial your, dial your cell phone, right? So that doesn't even have nothing to do with Wi-Fi, right. but it, it, it all inter, interrelates, right? Maybe the Wi-Fi network's providing location services to the cell network, right? Yeah. It, it all interconnects. So I, I believe that they're all very integral and all very important, and the building owner, the carriers and us as the end users are all, you know, taking part in that and, and looking for that level of service. The technology has to just, emer you know, kind of push to the forefront, and it is right now. I think all the OEMs are looking to provide that level of functionality mm -hmm. that hasn't been previously available. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think that's challenging as an OEM, right? Because your cycle to to develop is a longer period of time. And so this demand has sort of come on, I guess we say it's come on really fast, but certainly the way we're using the technology today is very different than the way we used it uh, back when I was at CNS deploying systems, right? I mean, we wanted five bars in every bathroom and broom closet, but that's because we could sell more units and, and we could create a higher ARPU. Um, now it's much more about just that total solution and having that um, not just coverage but much more about capacity and that's been a, a dynamic uh, shift in the environment that I think many of us are just really starting to become acclimated with. You know. um, well, I want to, before we open it up to questions, just sort of um, open it up to the panel and see if there was anything else that we wanted to highlight that maybe didn't get covered in questions or anything you wanted to expand on. I can jump in. I, I, yeah. I think one thing that's also important to consider, we've talked about the challenges of creating a, a, a great experience over Wi-Fi for the end user, and some other things to consider when, when deploying Wi-Fi is, you know, what are ways that you can um, capture as much bandwidth as possible from the system? Mm -hmm. And one way to do that is to, you know, have different levels of a different tiered experience depending on the type of user that comes in. And maybe it's a, a limited bandwidth for, for free consumption and there's a way to monetize it through upgrades. Um, or, you know, if someone wants to watch video or Netflix, mm -hmm. maybe they got to pay for that. But, you know, the, the, the free Wi-Fi is kind of a limited experience. Uh, so there's, there, there's other ways besides, you know, blowing the place out with a ton of access points to, to, to salvage bandwidth. Uh, what, what we find is it's typically the, you know, 80-20 rule, 80% 80 of your bandwidth is consumed by 20% of your users. And so if those users, if you have a mechanism for which to charge them for the bandwidth that they're consuming, that's certainly something to consider as well. Yeah, I'm sort of curious as to, because I've actually seen more and more of the, well, for free, here's what you get, but if you want to pay a little bit yeah. more. Um, and that's been over the course of the last probably three or four months. It's been sort of all of a sudden. I'm kind of curious as to what the analytics will tell us who actually elects to pay for that? Because I'm one of the people that I need what I need now, and I don't want to wait, so I'll yeah. pay. But how many people are really willing to do that, I guess? Yeah, there's a, there's a great anecdote from uh, some airports that we used to manage in, um, in Norway. Uh, we had a kind of tiered experience where some of it was free and the rest of it was paid. Uh, they wanted to give you know 10 megs up and down to all their customers, so they uh, we lost the contract. They upgraded their system, spent millions and millions and millions of dollars. Um, and what they saw after they gave Wi-Fi away for free, unlimited bandwidth to everyone in the airport, was that their concession revenue went down by about 30%. So if you give people too much entertainment, they will use it and they will 
watch TV at the gate rather than spending money and duty free and at the bar and everywhere else. Hmm. So I think there's 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 certainly challenges to giving it all away, and that tiered experience can help you know drive that sort of behavior. Uh, from what from, from what I understand, uh, when Las Vegas Airport began giving away Wi-Fi for free, the gambling revenue went down by about 20 to 30 percent as well. So people aren't playing slot machines in the Las Vegas airport because they're busy on the Wi-Fi. So there's 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 also business reasons to limit bandwidth as well. That's true, and I, I don't know that it makes sense in my son's case why he doesn't do his chores, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Negative ROI. Exactly. Note to self, I'm going to shut Wi-Fi off when I go home. <laughs> uh, um, Ken, I think you had something to add to. Um, yeah, I, I just want to point out that, that first and foremost, uh, the operators paid billions of dollars for their license spectrum. And, uh, you know, uh, they, they, you know, they fully intend to want to provide that, that service over their license spectrum. And I know that my Wi-Fi on my phone is not on all the time. And I wouldn't want to have to remember to turn it on all the time every time I entered a potential gray zone. Someone called it a gray, gray hole. Gray zone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that's interesting. But um, ultimately, um, I, I truly believe it, you know, Wi-Fi augments. And the more transparent we can make it for the end user, I think the better. I think it, 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 it helps everyone's experience. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's times when a user would be perfectly willing to turn on Wi-Fi and run on that part of the network if they knew they were, they were going to either pay for a premium service, mm -hmm. like, oh, I'm going to connect to a 100 megabit pipe, I'm going to be flying, you know. I mean, maybe they'll pay nine bucks for that and say, no problem. Or they may be perfectly willing to be at a lower data rate with their license frequency if it happened to be a full network or at a stadium or whatever. But um, I, I, I think the, uh, for the next years right now, um, is a the more we can get to a seamless augmentation of the network, the better. Um, I don't I don't think customers really uh, you know they just want it when they want it, right? And that's, yes, I, more I, faster. I told, ex exactly, and that's only going to get you know worse and worse by the week as these devices get faster and can suck data even faster, you know. So, um, and 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 finally, the uh, ensuring that the Wi-Fi networks are truly neutral and fair. Uh, to all parties is really, really critical because uh, that's the only way you're going to be able to divide it up, mm -hmm. you know, and it, it really depends on the project. But for the most part, um, you know, it doesn't do any good for a hotel to have one, you know, one carrier that can have people roam and it didn't work for the other guy. Right. And which so is now, traditionally what we've seen, right? Exactly. Exactly. You know? And it's like, well, geez, which hotel is this? Is that the one that has this one or this one? I mean, that is not a good experience for your guests. Um, it may seem like a win. Oh, I got something for free, and I can, you know, I got that. But the reality is that's not, that's not the user experience that the building owner, doesn't matter if it's a hotel or even an enterprise for that matter, mm -hmm. is really looking for. Uh, they're looking for the true neutral experience. I mean, years ago, it was considered excess, success if you built a DAS and you got a carrier on it. Right. Yay, you know, you know five, seven years ago. But the building owners are like, no, 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 no. I think we need like two or three. And we're like, you know, years ago we'd say, yeah, right, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. But nowadays that's not the, it's, you know, that's not, that is not acceptable any longer. And, um, and even other parts of the world where uh, Asia and Europe where they typically, every carrier would build their own network. Well, now that they've got to rip and replace all those because they were, you know, 2G, 3G networks and now they've got to rip them out and put new Pico cells in, they're saying, holy Oh, we got to do this again. Mm -hmm. We got to spend all this money again. All right, we got to share some costs here. We got to do it more neutral. It's got to be more fair. You know, we can't all spend all this money all over again. You know? Right. Yeah. No. And I think to your point too, the the uh, the neutral host capability. People might have multiple devices, but I don't know how many people have multiple devices on multiple carriers. I know for me, for instance particularly because of the unlimited bandwidth, I might have my iPad with Sprint, and I might have my iPhone with somebody else, and another phone with somebody else, but because I want sort of that capability um, to take advantage of some of those rate plans. So I, I, would, I think that you know, a lot of people are. It goes back to that, I want more, bigger, better, faster you know, speeds and capabilities. So good. Um, I guess that lends me to Opening it up for questions. Do we have any questions for this group? Anybody? Go ahead. Oh, Tracy's got the mic. 
She didn't see you standing there. <laughs> Hi, Joe Sinkavich with Westchester University in Pennsylvania. And I'm coming at this from the opposite you know, direction that we've been rolling out uh, Wi-Fi on campus for about five years. And in fact, we just completed a blanket coverage of campus with uh, Aruba Wireless Networks um, Wi-Fi deployment. We've also just started building a new residence hall, and the builder is now telling us that the municipality is requiring us to install a DAS system. And only being able to deal with the builder, I'm still trying to understand exactly what the driver is. I, I'm assuming it's the public safety aspect. Um, but while I'm still trying to figure that out, I'm curious about both the carrier and the equipment manufacturer perspective of how are you able at this point to leverage or integrate with uh, an existing Wi-Fi infrastructure? Go ahead, Ken. Uh, the answer is you don't. <laughs> Today, uh, you know, uh, the DAS is essentially, uh, that's changing now. I mean, that's one of the things we're working on. Uh, the DAS has been, for a long period of time, a dumb pipe. It's basically a, a pipe that allows you to put RF in on one end and output it further away at the other end, which has been great when you're trying to provide five, bar five bars of voice service, but the dumb pipe doesn't have any IP connectivity. So as such, it doesn't lend itself. Now, like I said, that trend is changing. There's lots of OEMs working on providing solutions that can run IP and um, RF, um, but the reality is um, there's, no, there's no perfect thing right now. Um, but the reality is those things are all, all coming. But right now, Wi-Fi and DAS are essentially separate infrastructures. Um, but in the bench, eventually what you'll see is that they'll all go on the same fiber and the same cable, and they'll just have a different box for each one. You'll have your, you mentioned Aruba, you'll have your Aruba box, and you'll have your other box, solid box, whatever. And they're potentially right next to each other or someplace else um, providing both types of services. But right now, it's uh, just starting to happen. Yeah, and the, uh, the DAS piece with regards to public safety is likely the driver. Um, you tend to get benefit from the carrier perspective if you have a BDA in place and a retransmission agreement in place with that carrier that the public safety entity may be benefiting from if you're propagating that six, seven, eight hundred megahertz that their radios are communicating on. So that's likely the driver of why, uh, why they're asking you to do that. Plus you also have an occupancy issue as well from a DAS perspective that you really don't have from an outdoor Wi-Fi perspective. Uh. So uh, with regard to the uh, wireless network uh, and uh, voice uh, overlay, how at this point uh, are, are you still saying that there's a third party app that you must use, something like Skype, to take advantage of that? Um, and where this is, this is a, maybe a multi pronged question. Um, I'm, how do you see the, the, the voice over LTE may very well play into this scenario, and or do you see that, that you're likely to come to a more eloquent solution that's just native Wi Fi? Uh, before voice over LTE takes uh, precedence? Great question. I think all of those are in play if you're an end user at this point. Um, most notably now, if you have LTE, you can take advantage of a Skype app and be able to communicate voice over LTE via, via Skype. Uh, you can also do that via Wi-Fi or, or, or something of that nature. When you start looking at LTE native from a carrier perspective, the standards aren't there yet. You know, when carriers started implementing LTE, I want to say it was release 8, release 9. I, I think we are looking at voice specifications over LTE native to a carrier probably in release 12. Um, so we're probably some time off before that's native. But in the meantime, you're looking at an external app to be able to do voice over LTE or, or voice over, uh, over Wi-Fi. Is the 802.11U, does that play into that? I mean, in theory, that's uh, uh, I'm hearing that there's going to be some devices that are smart enough to to either go to the phone or go to the Wi-Fi um, network, and um, so just you know, what does your crystal ball say about all that? I think again, you're still going to have an external app, and in order for it to be native, those standards are going to be able to or need are going to need to be there to support voice native to that and have that built in from a device perspective. If Samsung or HTC or whomever decides to make that native to the device and the carrier decides to take it 
advantage of that, then you'll see it. But I think at this point, it's going to be a third-party app that's going to take advantage of whatever pipe is available, LTE or Wi-Fi. We're, we're part of uh, trials for 802.11u and 802.11ac, uh, some live mm -hmm. trials with some of the larger global carriers. And that's definitely a topic of conversation. Mm -hmm. So everyone's engaged on that front. They all want to get there. Uh, but I think the first step in that whole process is to define the standards, understand how the back and forth roaming is going to go, and then apply the different technologies to solve different problems. From a technology perspective, the biggest issues on VoIP are latencies. And so the, uh, both on the Wi-Fi networks and on the LT networks, as we build all IP networks, it's, it's dealing with the latency issues on the voice. Um, specifically, even if you're trying to add things like push to talk or call lists, you know, call groups, um, we're, you know, definitely, in addition to roaming technology issues. Um, but, you know, just like it took some time for VoIP, like Vonage and those kind of services to eventually happen, um, uh, and there's lots of them, right? They, uh, it, it's going to take time for this as well, right? But LTE potentially will be able to handle that transport capability. Let's remember that LTE is in its very early phases right now. The, the, the network technology has so much more potential and growth, and uh, that's the exciting part, um, which is why uh, when I talk about building infrastructure that can support those f the future, it's pretty intense level of speeds. Because we're not, right now we're like, yeah, I got five megabytes to the phone or 10, right? We're talking about delivering, you know, 50, 20, 50, you know, megabits. So, and, but even with the speed, you have latency. That is the biggest, uh, probably one of the biggest hurdles is latency issues in the network. Anyone else? All right, well, this is wrapping up our time anyway. So please join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you, guys. Uh, just some logistics. The exhibit hall is now open for an hour. And then um, starting at uh, 1215, there will be buffets the same place as your breakfast buffets are. And you can come eat in here. And then Scott Simone's on at 1 o'clock.